This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Great to have all of you here this morning in God's house. The sermon theme for this morning is out of Genesis chapter 4, and it's matters of the heart. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's share that as we introduce ourselves to one another this morning. Continue with their opening hymn.
In remembrance of your baptism, I invite you to make the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our psalm.
Father's glory. Amen. Our glad be reply. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and always ready to give more than we either deserve or desire. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy. Forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and give us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except by the merits and mediation of of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn, or the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Caden said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and at the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might, might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear, it, might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. In honor of the Holy Gospel, I invite you to rise for the Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We remain standing for our creedal hymn, hymn 941. I'll come through the aisle and collect any prayer cards.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When Emily was pregnant with Lydia, she had to go in for this most remarkable ultrasound. You see, due to the fact that Nora had undergone open heart surgery just before the age of three because of the hole in her heart, they wanted to ensure that Lydia's heart, while still in the womb, was healthy. And so off to the hospital we went, and there they did an ultrasound inside the heart, inside of the baby, inside of the womb. Now, to be able to do an ultrasound of a baby in and of itself is really cool. But to be able to see the heart in remarkable detail inside of the baby in the womb to ensure that all the chambers and the vessels were operating correctly is simply amazing. Today's text is the story from Cain and Abel. And it is a most unfortunate series of events as the earth was in its infancy and yet sin is on full display. And as we examine this text, what it comes down to is a matter of the heart. What does God see when he looks at your heart and mine? Now I'm going to take a slightly different approach than I ever have here in a sermon And I am going to invite you to get out your pew Bible. So grab the pew Bible in front of you. It's the one that's not the hymnal. It says Bible on the front. And I want us to follow along in the text. And as I say to the older kids in chapel, if you have a younger child next to you, help them to follow along. Or if the person next to you isn't paying attention, help them to follow along. There we go. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 4. It's on page 3 in your pew Bible. And it's going to start with Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to be going through the entire text. And we'll just take different chunks of the text. And then we're going to talk about each portion under that theme of matters of the heart. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought up to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of his flock and of their fat portions." Stop there for a moment. Now, this first portion of the text really just sets the stage for the rest of the text. Adam and Eve had been told to be fruitful and multiply, so they commenced with having children. And as Adam's occupation was a farmer, it only made sense then that his children would follow suit. Also, because there were probably not many other occupations at the time, there was no coffee shop to be a barista. All right? (laughs) That's why I didn't live during that time period. (laughs) But as brothers often do, they chose different occupations. So Cain became a farmer of the land. Abel became a farmer of livestock. But now here comes the difference, even more so. Their offering. The text says that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Likely what he did was he did whatever he thought was just enough to be able to kind of meet his requirement in his mind, just so that he would be able to get the blessings from God. Whereas Abel, on the other hand, what you see is is that he brought the fat portion, all right? And as we all know with bacon and ribeyes, the fat portion is the best. If you disagree with that, you're wrong. All right. (laughs) But with that being said here, he brings the best of the best, the first fruit, all right? And so what I want us to do is I want us to think back to a few weeks ago here because in that text, God challenged all of us to consider our giving, our offering unto the Lord. And so I'm going to ask you the question, did you go home and evaluate your giving to the Lord? 
Did you take a look at your budget and actually see, do you trust God with all that you have, even your income? Do you give to God? from your leftovers or do you give to God from your first fruits do you give the fat all right do you give like Cain or do you give like Abel and also what's your motive for giving do you give just so you maybe Abel can get a little bit back from God you don't have that kind of that Cain mentality or do you give because you know you've been given so much from God in his death and his resurrection, and you give joyfully like Abel. How do you give? And don't think here for a second that it's the amount of your giving that matters. Instead, rather, Scripture says the heart of the matter here is is that the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. A person can be a millionaire and give begrudgingly. Oh, i got to do that. Or you can be like in Luke 21, you've got the story of the widow and the mite there. And she gave two little copper coins. She gave all she had, and she gave with joy. So where is your heart when it comes to giving to the Lord? And I want you to think about that in light of also the capital campaign. Now, I don't have this in my sermon, so let's just make it a little bit longer. All right, But I want us to think about that because Tim shared here last Sunday that if we actually get to the point that we can actually raise enough funds for this building, we can actually have it open at the start of the school year. I mean, think about how awesome that would be. I can tell you, after having gone through all the building committee meetings or many of the building committee meetings, that likely was never a thought in our mind. And yet now it's a possibility. And so how do we give sacrificially? Where are you at with giving in your heart? Okay? I'm going to leave you with that question. Let's dive back into the text. So the second half of verse 4. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You see, God knew Cain's heart. He knew Abel's heart. He knows your heart. He knows mine. He knew that Abel believed in God, trusted in his promises, and so gave from that trust. But he also knows that Cain, on the other hand, had hardened his heart toward God. Though he'd been taught likely how to worship by his parents, he'd rejected that lesson. Nope, not going to pay attention. All right? And in doing so, rejects God. We know this to be the case in so many families just as it was with the first family on earth. I mean, it grieves our hearts when kids are raised in a Christian home, they go to a Christian school, they go to a Sunday school, participate in youth group, you name it, all sorts of different Christian education opportunities, and yet for whatever reason, they reject the true God in their hearts. And so here what we see is the assault of the evil foe is real, and why we need to be on guard at all times against him. Because that's definitely the case in the life of Cain. The serpent had already done his dirty deed back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and now the original sin that had been passed on to their children is now rearing its ugly head in their firstborn son. Cain was filled with anger, more than likely towards God. But he's also filled with jealousy, more than likely toward his brother. Have you ever been filled with anger? What about jealousy? What impact does that have on your heart? Like Cain, it likely hardened it. It hardened it so much that he was not willing to listen to God anymore. He wasn't willing to listen to God's warning when God says this, if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. You see, God could see the anger welling up in Cain's heart. 
God knew that if Cain didn't do something here quickly to help curb that anger, if he didn't repent, if he didn't have that change of heart about sin and about God, then something awful was going to happen. So it is with us. Whenever we allow that anger to bury its roots down deep into our hearts, it isn't long and all of a sudden we don't have ears to hear what God has to say. And we don't pay attention to the voice of the Lord calling us to repentance for our hatred burning from within. Instead, we choose embitterment and a lot of times we act on that embitterment. And that was the case with Cain. Look at verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. If you were reading the NIV, the New International Version right here, it would actually say this, essentially. And Cain said to his brother, let's go out to the field. In essence, it's, let's go out behind the woodshed. Hmm. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him him now let that sink in for a second Cain killed his own brother here God in essence had just told Cain flee from this temptation and instead he went and did the extreme of the exact opposite now, no doubt we could relate. Has there ever been a time where you knew what the righteous thing to do was, and instead you did the exact opposite? Has there ever been a time when you were just so mad that you just didn't care how what you said or what you did impacted the other person? Remember that breathing exercise that I taught you a few weeks ago where we're supposed to breathe before we actually say something or do something because we need to think about how it's going to impact the other person? Cain would have really benefited from that at this point. Take a deep breath, brother. Think about what you're going to do because it's definitely going to impact your brother in a really bad way. And that's what he did. He killed his brother. Have you ever been so angry with someone that you wanted them dead? Truth be told, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, likens hatred to murder. So for any of us who have ever hated another, we have committed murder. And where? In our hearts. And if you are thinking at this point that this is a pretty heavy text, <laughs> people kind of question. They were like, Pastor, you're preaching on Cain and Abel. You are crazy. All right, well, I will take that label. But it is a heavy text. See, think about it. Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 6, two chapters later, right before the flood, the wickedness of man is great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Cain had defiled, he had a defiled heart. And so do we. Take a look at verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? All right, and this is where you got to put tone into the Bible, okay? All right? And I'm going to do that. He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Just like God had done with Adam and Eve, so he does with Cain. Remember in the garden, God is walking in the cool of the day, and he called out to Adam and Eve, Where are you? It's not that God didn't know where they were. It's not that God doesn't know where Abel is and what has happened to him. No. This 
is where God in His infinite mercy is at work. So for those of you writing sermon notes, this is where we shift from law to gospel. Alright? So, in God's infinite mercy, God knew exactly what had happened. He knew that evil had taken place, and yet it's like He's reaching out to Cain. And He's saying, Admit what you've done. Confess what you've done. And I will forgive you. God is doing that in mercy. And God mercifully does the same with us. He knows the evil intent of our hearts. He knows that we have no desire to come clean and admit that we are wrong. He knows that if we're left to ourselves, we would rather choose to hide from Him forever, live life on our own terms, and just do whatever we want to do. And yet He still, in mercy and grace, calls out to us. As we heard just a couple of weeks ago, He leaves the 99 in the flock to come and search for the lost. He comes to search for you as well. And that's what He did here today. Here earlier in this service, God called to you in confession and absolution. He called out to each and every one of us because He knows what you've thought through the week. He knows what you've said. He knows what you've done. He knows what's in your heart. He knows how filthy and defiled it is. And yet, He says, confess it. Repent. Turn from your sinful ways. i got good news for you. And I will forgive you. No matter what it is. No matter how much hatred you have had in that heart. I will forgive it. Now go and sin no more. Unfortunately, Cain, he didn't want any of that. He was too stubborn in his sin. Any stubborn people here? Any Germans? By the way, I am 0% German, and I am just as stubborn as you. And my wife is 100% German. She might be a little bit more stubborn than me. (laughs) Just kidding. But here, how many of you struggle to admit that you're wrong? How many of you, when you dig your heels in, really struggle to say, I am wrong? There's not a one of us that likes to say that. And so it was with Cain as well, as he's digging his heels in. So turn to verses 11 and 12. The Lord said, And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Instead of repentance and forgiveness, Cain chose punishment. And we might ask, why would you do such a thing? But we see it all the time. We've seen it in countless people, likely near and dear to us, who have chosen to remain in their sin rather than confess it. And as devastating as it is to admit, we know that those who choose to remain in their sin will be sentenced to eternal condemnation. Such truth beckons each of us to daily return to our baptism, confess our sins so that we don't harden our hearts away from God forever. We look at verses 13 to 15 in the close of our text. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Once again, Cain doesn't repent. He only focuses on the punishment with this woe is me mentality where punishment is meant to be a form of discipline that is to drive us to repentance. Such was not the case with Cain. He only hardened his heart all the more and lamented his lot in life. But you see, it is as the psalmist says, the Lord is merciful 
and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Though Cain's heart and ours may be defiled and hardened with sin, God's heart beats nothing but love for you, for me. Though we don't know what that mark was put upon Cain, we do know what the mark was that was put upon us. It was the mark of the cross. Where was it put? The mark of the cross is put upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as redeemed, that you've been bought back from death into life by Christ the crucified. Christ the crucified. The very offspring of Eve was sent from heaven to earth to soften our hardened hearts, to cleanse our defiled hearts of all sin, of all hatred and anger and jealousy. Yes, in love for us, God has opened up our chest cavities and performed an open heart surgery on all of us. From His very heart upon the cross, His blood poured into the ground beneath Him. And that blood cries out. It cries out as it did from His very own lips. It is finished. Done for are your sins. Done for is your death. And done for is the devil forever. You see, when it comes to matters of the heart, God's heart can't help but love you and forgive you. It's what He does. It's who He is. And He is alive in you so that you, with all that you've been given in this life, may love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. As we close the day, I want to leave you with these words. They're words from the very heart of your loving God. And they're words that you know oh so well. And so let them sink in. Let them sink deep into your heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son the offspring of Eve, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is God's gift from His heart. Let it sink deep into yours. In Jesus' name, Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise as we continue with the prayers of the church. <clears throat> we pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you are in all things. You hear the prayers of all. Hear us now as we pray to you as sinful people, knowing that our hearts and all of us have been redeemed by the blood of your Son, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Spare the servants of your church from the love of wealth and the fear of the difficulty of their task, that they would gladly set aside every comfort for the sake, for your sake, and for the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Judge of, judge of all, grant justice according to your word to those who suffer wrong. Give wisdom and understanding to the leaders of all nations, especially our own, that they may punish evil and reward good, fearing God and respecting man. As we approach the midterm elections, we pray that all of us would be sure to practice our civic duty and vote. We pray also that you would raise up leaders that would safeguard life from the point of conception, leaders that would allow religious freedom to to prevail, leaders that ensure that all can speak freely, leaders that protect marriage and family, leaders that ensure the parental rights are that parental rights are guaranteed. Lord, in your mercy. 
Heavenly Father, you have caused your, the sacred writings of your word to be proclaimed throughout all generations. Encourage and strengthen parents to teach your word to their children that your people may be trained in righteousness and equip, equipped for every good work. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, you have made us all heirs of your kingdom through holy baptism. Holding the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, keep us in that faith as we continue to run the race that you have called us to waiting for the day when we receive the crown of righteousness, Lord, in your mercy. When the righteous cry, you hear, O Lord, and deliver them out of their troubles. Draw near to, to save the brokenhearted, the crushed in spirit, the sick and those in need. This morning especially we pray for Joan, Schwar Joan Schwartz, who is in need of healing and is in the hospital currently. Be with the doctors and nurses overseeing her care, that she might return home in, in full health. And we pray for those all you, we name before you in our heart. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for seminarians Dale Cranky and Mark Esser as they prepare for the office of the Holy Ministry. We also pray for Paige, Mark's wife, as she's expecting a child this coming spring. Keep, keep both her and the child in your care. Bless and keep, bless, keep and protect Pastor James May as he serves as missionary in Kenya. Bless his partnership with Dr. Harold Ristow, who is now serving as missionary with him at the Lutheran School of Theology. Lord, in your mercy. Generous Lord, you have given us more than we could ever imagine. Grant us generous hearts to, to give from what we have been given to support the capital campaign as we look to build an additional three classrooms and bathrooms. While this campaign go, goes on, we ask your blessing so that our current ministries are also supported. You, all, you know our needs, so please provide according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Most gracious God, we give thanks for the joy and blessings you grant to husbands and wives. Assist them always by your grace with a true fidelity and steadfast love that they may honor and keep their marriage vows. Grow in love toward you and for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Gather us in the blessed sacrament around the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world whom saints and angels adore around your eternal throne. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Be seated. At this time, we go before the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. I invite you to fill out a fellowship pad found in the inside aisle in the, of your pew. The date is November 20... Or, not November yet, October 23rd. Um, we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offering.
Please rise. <clears throat> hear what these hear what St. Paul writes in First Corinthians chapter eleven before we continue with the service of the sacrament. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Therefore, taking to heart the word of the Lord, if you've not been instructed in the Lutheran faith, you doubt the presence of the Lord in this meal. It's out of love for you that we'd ask you to refrain from receiving the sacrament and speak to a pastor afterwards if you have any questions. If you'd like to come forward and receive a blessing, simply fold your arms across your chest so that we know to do so. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you who have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared through, for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross, and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that comes to us in his body and his blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in both body and soul to life everlasting. Depart with his peace and his joy. Your sins are forgiven. We sing the Nunc Dimittis. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. To God. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Be seated. If you are in Sunday school, you may depart at this time. 
just a few brief announcements how we can share Hope and Teach Christ this week. Remember, uh, Junior High Youth for the month of October is looking for your donations for the local food banks. We will be making boxes when we meet in, uh, in November I forget what, wait, what week, second week of November, November 9th, um, that is for the theme of Thanksgiving. So we're looking for non-perishable food items around the theme of Thanksgiving so we can make boxes to don't drop those off at local food banks. Uh, marriage small group ministry, still looking for people for that. So it's still got openings for that. So if you are interested, there's a sign-up genius in the bulletin, or you can contact the church office and, and explain or say that you're interested in that, and we'll sign you up. Uh, church, work, church Worker Appreciation Month for the month of October. Uh, we'll just continue to promote that as it is more than just Clergy Appreciation Month. It is all Church Worker Appreciation Month, and we're doing that. So if you have any donations to give, please do um, give to the church office. But also, if you have any checks to write, write uh, Church Worker Appreciation Month in the memo. Trunk or treat next week. Next week, Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. We're having a trunk or treat. And it's going to be awesome. I might be Daniel in the lion's den. It's going to be so cool. I'm going to be Daniel because I have a beard. And maybe something else. But anyways, uh, so we're going to have Trunk or Treat on, out here in the parking lot from 4 to 6 p.m. All, all are invited to come and help out or show up. Bring your kids, bring your grandkids. It's going to be fantastic. Remember, we've got the fish fry down at the community center going on starting at 10.30 to 1.30. All you can eat. Excellent fish. And that is all I have for our announcements this morning. I uh, just want to reiterate the fact that if uh, you have any donations for the uh, capital campaign, place it in the Building a Legacy box in the back there. Uh, you can see our progress there on the thermometer, just as a reminder, uh, in order for us to be able to break ground by that March 1st date, that's the real goal there, so that we can actually, uh, we need two-thirds of the amount raised. That's in excess of $750,000 to be able to do so. We'd love to have full participation from the congregation. You should have received that letter already. Uh, and so what we're encouraging is, is a one-time gift, and if all possible, a one-time gift and a three-year pledge, uh, so you can spread out your giving as well. Um, but again, in order for us to really be able to do that and align with the need of the construction manager, <laughs> we really need all of that really in by November 1st. Uh, so we're really on a strict timetable. Um, but it's been my uh, experience that the longer you draw things out, actually, the harder it becomes. So this is kind of nice that it's all being done really uh, in a quicker rate. Um, but please do uh, give careful consideration to that um, and then consider that generous gift uh, for the sake of our ministry here. Again, please do turn those in right away, though, uh, as we just can't delay if we are going to be able to have that opportunity to move into that building at the beginning of the school year. If you have any questions, contact our building committee, Capital Campaign. We can connect you to those people through the congregational office. But again, thank you so much for your continued generous support of this congregation. So much, much appreciated. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.